Good morning, everybody. Oh, what a joy it is to see you on this beautiful Lord's Day. We're so thankful that you're here. Today's going to be a very special time as we just uh, bring to you Vacation Bible School full force. And it's going to be wonderful to hear from the children and hear what God's done in their lives. But as we begin today, we want to start with God's Word. Psalm 18, verses 1 through 3. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Hallelujah. Aren't we glad we have that kind of a Lord? Amen. Praise band. All right, everybody. Good morning. Let's get up on our feet. Things are going to be a little different today. We're going, to, we're going to sing a little bit. The kids are going to come. We're going to have a great morning. You're going to experience what it was like at VBS. Uh, we're even doing some of the songs that we did with them, so the kids should know these songs as well. Uh, let's begin by singing about God's amazing grace. Amen? Breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is a failing love that you would take my place and you would bear my cross. You lay down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is a very love. And you would take my place. And you would bear my cross. done for me. Amen, amen, amen. 
Hey, good morning. Once again, everybody turn around and give each other a big high five. Give them a greeting today in the name of Jesus. Get ready, children. All right, VBS kids, if you were a kid and you went to VBS, you need to start making your way down to the stage right mm -hmm. now. Come on, It down, is time minions. for Minion Factory. Come on, kiddos. Come on, Come on let's over. do it. Kiddos, stay here. Stay here, kiddos. Stay here. Stay here. Yeah. Hello. It, did it look like we had a little fun this week? We sure did. That was just a little snippet. But must I say, under no other name would the young and the more wise meet together. And so we so thank you for all of our volunteers. Can we get, if you saw some people singing along with you in your pew, because they knew it. So if you can give her a a round of applause to all of our helpers. Raise your hand if you were, had a yellow tag. We had over 40 volunteers and close to 60 little minions. So we are so thankful for that. 
So in a short recap, day one, we learned that Jesus is loyal through the story of Ruth. And so we, were, we, were, we learned to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. Good. Day two, we learned that Jesus is humble through the story of King David. And that reminded us that we need to walk in truth and we need to do all the things and walking humbly with our God. And day three, we learned that Jesus, is, Jesus persevered through the story of Peter. And it reminded us that no matter what, our Bible verse was saying, don't get tired of doing the right thing. And so this, on Monday and Tuesday, we learned a little bits about what those right things were. And then on Friday, we learned that we needed to recruit others through the story of Paul. And that reminded us that we needed to go out. And what was the song? Speak up. That we need to be bold in our, our faith and speak up and recruit others. So that was our main, uh, our, our, our minion mission of the week. And of course, the overall theme was to know the master and know the mission. So I think we were confidently understood what that was. Uh, on top of this, we challenged the minions to um, help support our Love Inc. partnership for our backpacks. And you guys want to know, I just saw some come in. Who's, who's were those from? Oh, one for each team. Oh, JJ, you got to do the math. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so we brought in collectively over 500 items. So that's a lot of backpacks, right? Over 500 items. So that was amazing. And over here we had, let's see, our little minion minions, our mini minions, our little preschoolers. They had a 68 of, or 69 of those. And minion electric at 103 of those. And water works at 185 of those. And Mini Mechanical had 156. Now, I don't know what just came in, but uh, so Waterworks, come see me during our barbecue and I've got a prize for you. Okay? Yeah. Um, and so we, we, we want you to tour the factory during our barbecue. We want you to go and see our crafts, those leftover crafts. Um, story time was down in the basement. We spent a lot of time just making this in a fun and engaging um, place for for parents to bring in a safe, loving, um, Christ-centered, focused environment. And so I thank you um, for all of the donations, for the time spent um, on our children, uh, the, the stage props, all that stuff from high to low. We value the fact that we have for a whole solid week, for a couple hours that we can just to pour in and to love in them. And then also just the fact that TFB can work together, the feet and the legs and the eyes and the fingers can work together collectively for Vacation Bible School like this. So we thank you. Do we have more to share with them, like some songs? No. <sighs> I know, I know. Yes, let's sing another song. So this song, well, I'll let uh, Jared take over, but go ahead, find your elbow room. We don't want to knock anybody over. Miss Lily's being shy, but she needs to go down front so that the kids can see the motions and they need to remember them. So we're gonna, the kids are going to sing a song called One Way, which is another one of our theme songs for the week. So you if guys can, ready? If I can also share, though, on Friday, I forgot to talk about our mission. On Friday, we, we, we learned our mission all through the week. And on Friday, we met with our parents. And we actually went out in our community or stayed here at TFB, and we did a mission. And we had people, families drop um, goodies over at the fire station, at the police station. We had people go to the Goodwill and drop off some donations. We had others go to Starbucks and, and bought the uh, treats for four, five, six uh, carloads. Um, we had uh, the ballroom was cleaned up. We had a funeral yesterday. We had that all taken care of. So these kids got to work um, as a family to go and serve, just as God has called us to do the same. So we were so pleased. We have pictures up on our Facebook um, and I'll post them on the TFB website so that you can see our, our, our Facebook and all that stuff. So you can see some of this in, in live in action. So with that, let's go ahead and sing. All right, you guys ready? One way. In my life down at your feet, you're the only
one way. Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way. Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. You are always, always there. Every how and everywhere. Your grace abounds so deep. Go ahead, if you are in preschool or nursery, we'll meet you over in their rooms. Go ahead, minions, and back to your seats. Thank you, my friends. <laughs> uh, as you can tell, we had a lot of fun this week, and it was kind of cool to moonlight as a, as a, a band leader. Um, I got to kind of put on a different hat this week, and what a blessing it is. I... I love, I love when kids get excited um, about God's word, about worship, about singing, about just having fun together, and that's what this week was. And one of the things that, again, we learned, and this is a song that we sang this week too, was we want Jesus to use us, right? We want to be available for him, available for the master to be used by him. Um, this will be a new song, sort of, for some of you, but it also has an old hymn worked in, so I'm sure you'll recognize that. Um, but we're going to sing the song, Jesus, Use Me. Can we stand together, though, and sing this song?
Jesus, is it indeed all to you that we surrender today? We give you all of our hopes and our dreams, all of our anxieties and our fears. Lord, we give you, we give you it all today and ask that you would just use us in spite of and even in our weaknesses that we, by faith, would be used by you, Lord. So we surrender all today, all to you, that you would freely live in us. Lord, we ask that you would just anoint Jeremy today to bring us your word, to uh, share what you have been revealing to him over uh, these last few weeks on what it means to walk by faith, 
and not by sight. Open our eyes today to you, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. Go ahead and take your seats. And Jeremy, come on up and bless us with the word today. Hello, hello. Uh, thank you, Pastor Jared and bands, for letting me, uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm kind of a little out of practice in this. Um, but yeah, Miss Carla, thank you so much for um, just leading DBS. Could we give her a round of applause, please? <laughs> yeah, she did so much. But um, yeah, I had the chance to lead the skits, and uh, I was Mr. Manager, so Mr. Manager, that's who I am, especially to you VBS people. Uh, but to the rest of us, hello, my name is Jeremy. <laughs> I'm one of the youth pastors, or I'm the youth pastor here at the church. And um, let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11 this morning. Hebrews chapter 11. And while you're turning there, I want to talk to you a little bit about my toothbrush habits, uh, especially as a child. So when I was younger, and my mom can attest to this, I didn't really like to brush my teeth all that much. Now, it's not that I didn't like to brush my teeth, but it was more like, oh man, my bed looked so much sweeter than having to go to the bathroom take the toothbrush, put the toothpaste on the toothbrush, put the toothbrush to my mouth, scrape, scrape, scrape like that, gargle, spit, floss, and then go to sleep. It's a lot of work, right? You know, I was six. I had a busy life. <laughs> so my mom, she always seemed to know when I didn't brush my teeth. And my mom is a genius for this. Mom, you know how, right? What she would do is she would feel the bristles to see that if it was wet or dry. <laughs> and if she knew that I didn't brush my teeth, she wouldn't just come into my room, look at me sleeping, go like, oh, my angel, he's sleeping. I'll just remind him in the morning. No. <laughs> in typical Filipino mother fashion, what she does is she nags and nags, and do she does that. She'll take her finger, and then she'll swipe under my arm fat like this, and just keep going and keep going until I submit to what she wants me to do, and I'll wake up. My mom still does it to this day. <laughs> Not because of toothbrushing, but just, you know, because I got to be a better son and all that stuff. <laughs> but eventually I caught on. I found out what the method was, because at the time I was like, wow, this is sorcery. How does she know? <laughs> so when I found out, I was able to fool her two times. And uh, <laughs> she doesn't even know this, so you guys are all hearing this for the first time. But the first time, I went to the bathroom, got my toothbrush, put some toothpaste on it, put it in my mouth, and I didn't brush. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just kept it in my mouth for a minute. <laughs> then I washed it, put it away, went to sleep, and my mom did not catch me. Yes. <laughs> the second time, um, it was a lot less elaborate than that. I just put the toothbrush under the water, did like that, shook it a little bit, put it on the stand, and went to sleep. And then she also didn't catch me. Now, guys, church, those two examples that I gave you, did I actually brush my teeth, yes or no? No, right? Because when you brush your teeth, it doesn't just involve having a wet toothbrush, nor does it involve even having the toothbrush inside your mouth. But it is the action of moving the bristles to scrub those pearly whites of yours. And through that action, that is when you've truly brushed your teeth. Does that make sense, guys? So this morning, we're in Hebrews chapter 11. We're in this mini-series on faith. And we'll see how faith similarly requires action. So before we go further into God's word, may you please bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we pray. Um, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, Jesus, use me just like the song says. Um, I pray that these words are not my own, but Lord, that it is you and you alone, Lord, who is receiving the credit, the praise, the glory and honor for this. I pray, Lord, that we learn what faith is for real and that we live out of that faith, God. And help us to not leave this place without knowing exactly what you want us to know and to live out of that. So we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. So, as we've been doing the past couple of weeks, we're going to, reduce, we're going to do this for, again. Let's review right quick what faith is according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Read it with me, or if you memorized it, say it with me. It goes like this. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. 
Now, if we look at this passage alone, without any context, it seems, based on these words, that it is merely intellectual, that faith seems intellectual. Look at it again. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. When I assure my wife that I love her after she asks me for like the 15th millionth time, when I tell her that, she has confidence and knows that I do actually love her. Now, speaking of marriage, when I go to the gym and there's like a lady that passes by, do I look again? When I have the conviction to not turn back, I'm thinking, I'm internally processing that having my eyes just set on my wife alone is better than any instant gratification I can feel in that moment. So therefore, I don't turn. So it seems that assurance and conviction at first glance is fairly knowledge-based. But is that all faith is? No. Of course not, because faith, while it starts in the mind, is fully actualized when it translates into action. I'm reminded of the passage in James 2 where it says that faith without works is dead. Exactly. And so far in chapter 11, we learned, we've seen the faith of the patriarchs, or the founding fathers of Christianity. We've seen the faith of Moses, and now we're going to see the faith of the Israelites. And each of these characters, by faith, did. Yes, they knew who God was, but they didn't just stop there. They acted according to that understanding of who God is. So this morning, we continue. We're in verse 29, Hebrews 11, verse 29, and it says this. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. But the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail to tell me of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets and the prophets. So let's stop there. Now before I keep going, how many of y'all are or have ever been in love? Yeah. Okay, so for those of you who know what love is, love makes you do crazy things, right? We know that. And interestingly enough, by faith, God calls us to do crazy things as well. But that's not because our God is crazy, but because the methods that he chooses for us to do by faith based on human intellect and reason, seems illogical, impossible, and sometimes even downright absurd. So really quickly, based on this passage, I'm going to read for you the methods of faith that God calls the Israelites to do. And it's just going to be like a rapid fire going through this, okay? So the first thing, God splits a body of water, boom. And he's like, Israelites, cross it. (laughs) Number two, God promises land to the Israelites. But first, he makes them conquer the most fortified city in all of that promised land of Canaan. And he's like this. Okay, people, if you want the walls to go to the ground, here's what you're going to do. You're going to march around the city once a day for six days. And then on the seventh day, I want you to march around it seven times. And then after you hear the, after you hear the trumpets go out for a little bit, then everyone yell at the top of your lungs. Okay, God. Number three, Rahab. Um, There are Israelites who are going to be spying your land because the Israelites are going to conquer it. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to hide them in your house. I want you to lie about their whereabouts, and I want you to be a traitor to your people. Four, Gideon. I want you to defeat an army of 135,000 of my enemies. But first, I want you to dwindle down your 32,000-member army to, say, uh, 300. And then, don't use weapons. I want you to have trumpets and blow them while they're sleeping. Barak, number five, I want you to defeat the oppressors of Israel. They just happen to have 900 chariots of iron. Number six, we have Samson. Oh, Samson, you're at, you're at this Philistine party, but you're not having a good time. You're the laughing stock. And you have no hair. Oh, also, you have no eyes either. And your strength is depleted, Samson, because of your own doing. But for your last hurrah, I want you to crash this party to the ground. 
Number seven, we have Jephthah. Jephthah, um, you know your people, the one who banished you from your land, your homeland. I want you to go back to them and to lead them against their enemies. Number eight, David, I want you to take down this nine-foot behemoth of a warrior named Goliath. And your weapon of choice, it's not a sword, but it's a stone. Now lastly, Samuel, I want you to defy King Saul, who is an anger management issue, <laughs> to say the least, and he just wants to kill everyone. Um, so Samuel, defy the king and anoint the next king who's going to be a man after my own heart. All of these examples, by human reasoning, seem illogical, impossible, and absurd. But every example of faith here led to victory, and ultimately every example, God was pleased, and he was glorified. And I can go on and on about these stories. I even asked Pastor Jared if I can just stick in this passage alone. I'm like, can I just stick with these guys, and you know, you can deal with the rest later. I want to focus on this, and we can like see how awesome these characters were. But the more I read this passage, the more I realized it wasn't about the characters at all. The more I looked, I realized the purpose of this passage was not to point us to the people, but rather to their faith, and more specifically, the object of whom their faith was based on. So you see here, the faith of these characters is twofold. It consisted of two parts. It was first an acknowledgement of who God was, and then from there, it was acting based on their understanding of who God was. And that's it, folks. That's all faith is. It's very simple, and there's no magic formula to it. That's all it is, acknowledging who God is and what he's done, and then acting on that. And by faith, amazing things are accomplished. So we see, as we continue down in verse 33, what happens as a result of faith. Through faith, the prophets from earlier, conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of the lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. You see, these are powerful examples of what true faith produces. Because church, if you put your faith in ordinary things, then nothing's going to come out of the ordinary. But when you put your faith in an extraordinary God, then God allows extraordinary things to happen. Does that make sense? But here's the thing, church. As awesome as these things sound, conquering kingdoms, administering justice, this is by no means a health and wealth, name it and claim it gospel, because despite the extraordinary acts of God, the reality is that we're still in a broken and fallen world. So we can't ignore the remaining examples of what happens as a result of faith. So we continue on in verse 35. It says that some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. And others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. And they went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Now, church, it seems as if this part of faith, that's the one we kind of like want to shy away from, right? We collectively shy away and avoid it because none of us want to feel pain, right? None of us want to feel affliction and the mockery that comes from faith. We would rather see and feel the victory that comes out of faith. But this passage is telling us that as much amazing triumph happens, amazing suffering happens as a result of faith as well. Now, for me personally, I can't read this passage without feeling some type of fear. And for many of us, fear is the natural reaction of what happens when we read this passage. It's like, is this going to happen to me as a result of faith? Like, Jesus, I thought everything was going to be good when I started worshiping you. Now, why are all these bad things happening? I think sometimes we look through the Bible and we read it with blinders on. What I mean by that is like, we read the Bible only seeking the good things that it can offer us. And then when we do that, we end up using or actually rather misusing faith to conjure up whatever desired outcome we want. But the thing is, that's not the point. 
We are called to have faith and to fix our eyes on Jesus because we learn through the book of Hebrews that Jesus is greater than anything and everything we compare it to. And this isn't just some intellectual process like, oh, who's the greatest of all time in whatever sport? It's like Jesus is greater, but not only that, he's the only person worth putting our faith and our trust and our hope in. That is why we have faith. And that's the point, to have faith. When you look at what happened as a result of what these characters did by faith, it doesn't matter if it resulted in praise or mocking or comfort or suffering or even life or death. The end result was that it inspired generations upon generations of God-fearing people to continue persevering in their faith. Because a life lived through Christ alone is only the only life worth living. We have to take a step back for a second and look at what this passage means in the grand scheme of Hebrews. Because remember, the book of Hebrews was written to a real people in a real time period going through real oppression, real hardships. And here was the temptation that they had. It was like, you know what, I think I should just slide back in my faith. I should just slide back into the comforts of religion or anything, that ma- anything for that matter that's not Jesus. But the author is saying, don't do that. Stick with your faith. Keep going. And he uses the examples of these authors, or he uses the examples of these members of faith to inspire people to persevere in theirs. Church, does your faith inspire? Does your faith encourage? Does the way you live your life and your faith, does it point people to God or to yourself? Are we living lives that inspire others to continue to persevere in their lives? Um, These stories inspire the next generation to live out their faith and to persevere. Church, look around. We we saw up here, the people who might be texting upstairs in the balcony, that's the next generation. Are we inspiring them to continue living out their faith? Or are we just pushing our traditions at them and it's like, you better follow this without question. TFB, I believe that we as a church are called to be a beacon of light to to the South Bay. Does the South Bay know that? Do they see us as a community that is connected based on our faith in Christ alone? Or are we just a religious group that cowers under these walls and have religious ceremonies once or twice a week? Is that all we are, church? This morning, we talked about faith being more than just an intellectual process, but it filters through into our action. And we talked about how the action that God calls us to, by human reasoning, seems crazy and absurd. But we also understand that amazing, extraordinary things happen when we put our faith in an amazing, extraordinary God. Now, what happens as a result of that faith It can sometimes lead to comforting or discomforting situations, but it's worth putting our faith in Jesus because Jesus alone is the only one worth living for. So that's the recap of what this passage is saying. But with that, if I just left right now, then that's just merely an intellectual exercise. So let's keep going with this, shall we? I have two questions for you guys, and I want everyone to be able to Just sit within the privacy of your own heart and ask yourself these two questions. The first one, is your faith complete? Is your faith complete? Because remember, faith is, it consists of things that are twofold, right? It consists of understanding who God is and what he's done for us through his son, Jesus. And it's also acting on that faith. Now, for some of us at church, man, we got this intellect thing down. I can, we can talk people's ears off about Christian concepts all day long, but if that is all your faith is, then that's just like having a wet toothbrush. That's not faith completely, and I would venture to say that's not faith at all. Now, on the opposite side, 
we have some, maybe more of us, who just commit religious act after religious act after religious act, thinking that as long as I'm doing the things of faith, as long as I'm working, then I'm doing faith right. But here's the thing. If that's what you think faith is, then it's like doing the act of brushing your teeth and not even having the toothbrush in your hand. What is your, is your faith complete? Because it involves both. It involves an understanding of who God is and acting on that understanding. So what is your, or is your faith complete? Sorry. Then the second question is what is your faith producing? Remember, we put our faith in an extraordinary, amazing God. And based on that understanding, if we act in faith, doesn't it make sense that extraordinary, amazing things would happen as a result of our actions? So what is our faith producing? Are people knowing more about Jesus? Again, is, are we pointing people to God or to ourselves? Are amazing things happening through our church, or are we merely producing molds in the pews? I think the biggest reason why Christianity gets a bad rap is not because of the Christ that we represent, but because of the people who represent him. Because we talk a big game about God, right? That our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do for you. But then if we're supposed to be Jesus' hands and feet, here we are just being limp and on the sidelines. It sounds like kind of like a spiritual paralysis within the body of Christ. Because we know what's the right thing to do, but if we're not doing it, and then the outside world is looking like, who, who, aren't these people supposed to be doing the things that they're saying they're doing? If we're not, then we can't blame God for that. We have to look within. We can't blame media or society. I mean, yeah, that's a part, but ultimately, we need to look within first. Because if we want to change the outside, the first thing we need to do is change the inside. So with all of this being said, what do we do about it? Practically speaking, if you were to ask Pastor Jared or Pastor Raj or I, we might come up with some different ideas, but just here's my two cents. Here are the practical things that I think that we need to do as a church in order to live out this faith completely. Number one, and I'm preaching to myself right now, join a life group. Staff. Let's join a life group. <laughs> and I'm convicted in this because, well, I'm not in a life group yet. And also, um, being in charge of the junior high and the high school ministries, it can be so easy for me to be doing work and thinking that that alone is what faith is. But if I'm not being encouraged in my faith, if I'm not um, understanding more and more deeply who Jesus is, if I don't have people around me to keep me accountable for my actions, then I'm not really doing faith completely. So join a life group because you have a community set around you where you can grow in relationship with each other, be vulnerable about the ways in which we don't live up to the calling that Christ has placed for us, and then we encourage each other to act based on that, uh, based on that faith. So that's the first thing. Um, now, I don't want to have a raise of hands of who's not in a life group, but I do want you to raise your hand if you're the leader of a life group. Raise your hand if you're the leader of a life group. So, leaders of the life group, are our life groups doing faith completely? Or are we just growing intellectually? Because a life group, again, should not just be about learning who Jesus is and that's it. We can't just be satisfied with thinking about the thought of Jesus and being like, oh, that's enough. That's good. No, because we need to be encouraging each other towards action. That is when faith is fully realized. So, number one, join a life group. Two, leaders of a life group, create an environment that allows faith to be fully real. And then lastly, um, we learn this term Every time we go to camp, it's called OTS, Opportunity to Serve. Find an opportunity to serve. 
there was this sad idea that I learned about in seminary, and many people know this concept. It's called the 2080 principle, that 20% of people do 80% of the work. Man. So what does that mean for our church then? Now, this isn't me trying to shame you to get into the 20%, but if we're going to do all that God calls us to do, doesn't it make sense that it needs to be 100% effort from 100% of us? Find an opportunity to serve. Because when we learn about whom do you serve, we don't just have four days for the kids to do VBS just to learn and be intellectually stimulated, and it's like, okay, bye. We actually allowed them to put their hands and feet into action, to make their faith become full and realized. And if the kids can understand that church, then so should we. It's that simple. That is what faith is, is when we understand who God is and what he's done for us through Christ and then act on that. I want everyone to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want the band to come up. Lord, I believe that you've called us as TFB to be a beacon of light to the outside. But God, in order to do that, we first got to change the inside. The inside of these walls, the inside of our hearts, Lord. May we point ourselves to you. May we never be satisfied with the state of our faith. God, it's more than just having an intellectual understanding of you, God. It is also acting. It's serving you, Lord. When we love you, when we say we love you, that implies that we will act according to that love. God, I pray for a true, authentic faith for the members of this church and for everyone watching. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, church, I want to invite you to stand together with us. Uh, This song is so, I think, appropriate because it starts out by just saying a thousand times I've failed. (laughs) And yet your mercy remains because we know we're going to stumble and fail. Those characters that Jeremy mentioned in God's word, many of them failed often in, in huge ways. And we fail too. And yet we are caught in his grace. And when all else fails, we need to know that. But then it goes on in verse 2 to say, Your will above all else, my purpose remains. Is our purpose to follow Christ with everything that we are and serve Him with all that we have? Because that's what brings Him praise, right? That's how He is glorified as we do our good works. And and it glorifies God. We want to... Just be good stewards of what he's given us, right? So let's give him control of our hearts and our souls. Um, That we would embrace justice and praise. That we would love God. That we would love people. And we would teach others to do the same. thousand times I failed, so your mercy remains. Should I stumble again, I'm caught in your grace everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all
give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the just intellect it's not just action it is the coming together of both may our faith be complete and then what's going to be the result of that think about how much we can transform our community this nation the world for the cause of christ if we just had a full and complete faith i also want to mention for those of you who don't even understand who jesus is i implore you please ask the pastors them not me but them <laughs> They want, to, they want us to know who Jesus is. That is the main thing, that we point people to Christ with our lives, right? So let's go out and let's do that. We have practical examples on how to do that. Let this not just be an intellectual thing, but may our faith be expressed into action. People who are watching online, we love you. Everyone is dismissed. Join us at the barbecue, too. We're going to go through the back. 
and go through that building over there as well and head through the wedding room. If you don't know where that is, ask somebody. They will share with you. We got some yummy food over there and then grab a seat somewhere in the annex or the gym.